So before we start this second part of the lecture, are there any leftover questions? Yes, please. Yeah. Simulations of spin systems, yes. uh, and you know, since you also mentioned the spin systems and the gauge mm -hmm. theories at the beginning, maybe uh, if you could comment on that. No, uh, I would say nowadays there are many of these quantum simulators that can also do spin systems. I mean, I, I think uh, a different level of accuracy, of course. So this is definitely something feasible. So maybe in terms of uh, uh, let me try, try to build a table. So uh, here you can have uh, atoms which are itinerant, and uh, ions, sorry, ions, uh, circuit, QED, uh, and here you have instead atoms which are static or in, uh, in tweezers. That this also includes Rydberg. I mean, I would say that in terms of spin systems, all of them can do them. I mean, there are systems which are uh, almost perfect for this. Ions, circuit, uh, and atoms in tweezers. In atoms, you can do spin systems, but it's a bit more complicated. Because typically, you have to rely on virtual interactions, which are slower, so you are more sensitive to dissipation. So if you want to do spin, probably it in an atom are not the best. If instead you want to do Hubbard models, then itinerant atoms are good. You can do both fermionic and bosonic. Okay? In the other platforms, this is harder. I mean, for instance, in, in this, you can do bosonic. Uh, in circuit, you can do bosonic. And in ions, it's a bit harder. You can do bosonic. So depending on the type of physics you are interested in, different platforms offer advantages and disadvantages. If you are an energy person minded, you immediately see that this will be the thing that at the end you, will be, you might be interested in, which is fermions, quarks. Okay? And that's the reason why for most of this analog quantum simulation, so atoms, in the context of energy physics, atoms have a given advantage because they have fermionic statistics for free. Of course, you can then try to engineer fermionic statistics in other systems, but then it's not analog simulations anymore. It's digital, and then all of them are more or less on the same footing in terms of what you can and cannot do. Okay? But in terms of analog, I mean, if you, can, if you keep this table in mind, this is already indicative. Other questions? No. Good. So now... I will try to tell you in these hours why we are doing this. Okay? And in order to do that, <coughs> the first question that I would like to address is what problems in high energy physics require this approach? Problems in can benefit. from quantum computing slash quantum simulation. And I would say here there are two main things. Okay? Uh, let me tell you first the one that we will not cover. Sorry, maybe I close this. Otherwise, we also inform somebody else about our like. Okay, no, it's blocked. Okay, fine. The first line, um, it's motivated by Actually, data management. So, understanding and modeling experiments. Data plus understanding experiments. And this is actually something which is very, very, I would say, recent motivation. And it's due to the fact that one of the most important experiments in particular physics, uh, CERN, LHC, is now undergoing renovation and will have a very high luminosity over the next few years. And for these experiments, high luminosity implies that the number of data that they can produce reliably as a function of time sh skyrockets. Okay? And this skyrocketing is actually a challenge.
for particle physics theorists and experimenters because they will have very likely much, much more data than the one they can analyze. Okay? So then, for them, the, for them, the motivation to look at quantum is whether there is some algorithm from quantum computing that can help them manage these kind of things. I think it's a very interesting research line, but I'm very ignorant on that. If you're interested, there is this review by Christian Bauer et al. That I mentioned at the beginning, where you have a very good account of what's going on. And I think uh, I mean, if you are interested in this specific aspect, that might, be thing, that might be a thing. I mean, in particular, one of the things that people are uh, looking after are these approaches, so called quantum machine learning. applied on, their, on this kind of data sets. Okay? That's really the context where you have to see this. There is, however, another research line, which is the one I am mostly interested in, and we will cover this, which is simulating particle physics ab initio. Okay? Oh, energy physics. Ab initio. Ab initio uh, I will put it in parentheses because sometimes we will be interested in effective models. Okay? And there are some interesting aspects in doing this because the very same thing has been done in condensed matter. Okay? Okay? For instance, one of the, mm, I, I would say, most interesting research lines in, in the context of cold atoms has been trying to learn properties of the fermionic Hubbard model, which is a very famous model in the context of strong correlated electrons. In the, trying to do that for energy physics problem is, is, however, very different. I mean, in energy physics, what is nice is that we know extremely well the problem that we want to solve. Okay? So there is no ambiguity. There is a clear goal, QCD. Okay? Or, or the standard model, but typically QCD. So very well known target. For instance, in condensed matter, you can see, okay, I try to do a simulation, a quantum simulation of the Hubbard model, but then not necessarily everybody believes that the Hubbard model is the correct description of a given phenomenon. This in energy does not exist, this ambiguity. I mean, if you do the simulation of QCD, everybody agrees that QCD is the correct theory for a strong interaction. And I think this for quantum simulation is a key advantage. Okay? There is no ambiguity in what you do. Uh, and the other thing that we will see in these hours is that uh, the simulation for doing quantum on energy physics is, uh, is very crisp in the sense that uh, there are very clear computational challenges. Computational challenges. Okay. So these, I would say, are the two main uh, things in there. And now let me tell you a bit about these theories. Okay. So I will try to give you a review. What do we target? Okay, of course, we have our standard model. And as we have said before, there is an SU3 sector, SU3 gauge theory sector, and then there is this SU2 cross U1. Okay. Now, this is electroweak, and this is QCD. Now, we are typically not interested in this. And the reason why we are not interested in, in the context of this lecture is because theorists and experimentalists have already understood electroweak theories very well. Okay? Here there is very powerful perturbation theory methods that are enabled by the fact that the fine structure constant, which is equal to 1 divided by... Okay, okay very good. You know it better than I do. Okay? This is much smaller than 1. So this implies that in the context of these theories, let's say just perturbative expansions are, are useful. And you can actually, I think QED is one of the most well-tested theories ever, one of the most successful achievements okay. of science. QCD, the problem, the very beginning of the problem, is that this is not true. Actually, in QCD, alpha the equivalent of alpha will be of order 1. 
So QCD is by definition non-perturbative theory. You can do perturbation theory only at very small distances because there there is a property which is called asymptotic freedom. Okay? Actually very strange. Quarks, if you put them at very, very short distances, they actually not, don't interact. Okay? And there you can do some perturbation theory. But if they go at large distances, they interact very strongly. And this phenomenon is called confinement. Their potential increases like R. It's called confinement. Which is non-perturbative nature. And this is the reason why for QCD, you cannot just do perturbation theory. You have to solve it by other means, okay? Or simulate it by other means in order to make predictions. This, typically for theories, we say that this requires a non-perturbative approach. And now, the scope of this lecture, I will tell you now a bit how people Typically, in energy, formulate this non-perturbative approach. And then, based on that, we will see the things that can be done and the things that cannot be done. And for which, we will need quantum computer or quantum simulator or might need. Yes, please. OK. Uh, they, they mean that if you write down so the basic interactions, that, uh, that are at play there, there is a local symmetry that you have to impose in order to, to have a consistent theory that describes physical observations. Now you could tell me, uh, but if I think about electrodynamics, in principle I could forget about the electric field and the magnetic field, I could write a theory based just on electrons. And I will be able to recover a lot of results. And there, there is no gauge symmetry. So if you want a gauge symmetry, is a redundancy in the degrees of freedom Okay? that we utilize because we want to have a local description of a phenomenon. Okay? So this is, uh, I would like to emphasize this, okay. Gauge symmetry, ah, gauge, yeah. Okay, well, there is nothing else space. So let me write these philosophical comments here. Gauge symmetry is equivalent to redundant description. That, however, comes very naturally because this redundant description allows us to keep concepts as, such as locality, blah, 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 intact. Okay, so there is a very strong conceptual advantage in utilizing that. We will see also there is a practical advantage, but. I think this was not the reason why it was introduced, okay? More questions? No, okay. So, the non I mean, there have been, of course, several approaches toward QCD, okay? I will just cite one, which is the core for us, and it's not only the core for us, it's probably one of the most successful tools, and it's called lattice gauge theory. Uh, how does it work? So the basic idea of lattice gauge theory is actually very simple. So one takes this Lagrangian of quantum chromodynamics or whatever other theory you're interested in, and then you write it as a path integral, as a statistical mechanics model, that now lives in uh, three plus one dimension. Okay? Because when we write down the path integral, we have to add imaginary time. Hmm? And if you want to see this in formulas, you do it as follows. Maybe I can use this other blackboard. Hmm? And I will also show you this, uh, another example. So the idea here is that you, put your, you have your lattice that you utilize for, 
for defining your theory. And in your lattice, there are three directions. You can have, for instance, have x and y. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me do it like this. x, y, and then this other direction is the imaginary time. So each of these planes is an equal time correlation, OK? And here it's imaginary time. The imaginary time direction has a given, uh, the real time direction have, have, have given length. This can be L, this can be F. This will be the physical dimension of your lattice. And then the imaginary time direction will have another length that we call L tau, which will be essentially proportional to uh, beta, OK? This is the inverse temperature. The construction that people do at this QCD is something that in statistical mechanics is, is known. Okay, you can do the same thing if you took look at, for instance, the quantum easing model. Okay? If you have a quantum easing model, and suppose that you want to study its properties non-perturbatively. Okay? What do you do? You put it on a lattice, and what you write it, it becomes a classical easing model, which is anis anisotropic in dimension, if the, if the original guy was in dimension D, this in dimension D plus 1. Okay? This I don't know if you are familiar with, but this is one of the most important uh, mappings in, in the field of, uh, we we'll say, condensed matter, so path integral to classical statistical mechanics correspondence. Okay? We are doing the same here. It's just that instead of having the easy model, which is relatively simple, we have a very complicated theory, which is in continuum. Okay? So in addition, we will have to take some sort of continuum limit. Okay? But conceptually, it's very similar. Now, that's our lattice. And now on the lattice, what we have? We have a partition function, and we've write it down. We have to, we will have to perform some integral, and the integral will be both on the gauge fields and there will be an integral also on the fermions. There will be our gauge fields. This will be on the fermions. I'm not specifying too much what this integration means, because we will do that later when we do the lattice. And then here we will have e to the minus 1 divided by h bar, and here we have the action. Okay? Integral dx, integral of d tau, Lagrangian of QCD. Okay, that will be our action, SQCD. So the idea is that we want to write this now. Up, oh, yes. No, no, wait. This is a different thing. I mean, you can always do this. Then the point is interpreting this as a probability distribution is not guaranteed. OK? Of course, no, you're right. I mean, this is also basis dependent. Yeah, yeah. And of course, this is easy to do when you deal only with spins, because spins have a very, or bosons have a very simple classical description. With fermions, you have to use Grassmann variables. It's a bit, it's a bit more involved. And it's not always a probability distribution, and we will see this. No. More questions? OK. Anyway, now wh what is happening is that we would like to put this formula, which is true on the continuum, we want to put it on the lattice. Hmm? And the idea, I, mean, I would like to give you an example. for a theory without fermions, so an, of an SU3 gauge theory. But you can do the same thing for uh, U1, for everything. So the idea is that you take the lattice. The lattice here will be discretized, of course. There will be plaquettes, and there will be a lattice spacing that I can call A. A is the lattice spacing. Mm -hmm. 
And the idea here is that you, we define variables that live on the bonds. Okay? Let me take now for simplicity a labeling of these four vertices as x, y, z, and w. And then what we say is that on each of these bonds there is an object, u, x, y, which takes value on the group SU3. There will be matrices in our case, SU3. Okay, so the matrices. And the idea is that gauge transformation acts on these objects as follows. So essentially, we have, if we apply a gauge transformation at the site X, U X Y gets affected by something which is the transformation itself at the site X, dagger, U X Y, uh, omega X. That's the action of a gauge transformation. Now, our goal is to write down an action that is gauge invariant. Goal. action is ga gauge invariant. And the way to do that so essentially, the way to do that is the following, is that instead of taking just a single parallel transporter, which is obviously not invariant under arbitrary transformations, what we take, we take what is so called plaquette operator. And the plaquette operator is the product of these objects over the full plaquette. So we'll have u, x, y, u, y, z, u, z, w, and u, w, x. Huh? So this is our candidate for the action. And now what we do, we try to look at the, at the tra gauge transformation on this. Okay? So u prime plaquette. So we apply four gauge transformations. Okay? The first guy here, what does he get? He gets omega dagger x. U X Y Omega X uh, so Omega X Oh yeah yeah no 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 wait 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 making a complicated business sorry 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 Ch -ch -ch -ch. sorry you have to do it like this you have to do it uh, like this No, I'm now wondering what is the best way of showing this to you. Actually, let me give you to, as an exercise, okay, <laughs> to show you, because there are two ways of doing this computation, to show you that if you apply gauge transformation at the site X, this object remains invariant. Okay? It's simple. Gauge transformation, if X is not entering, they do not appear. They only appear in here, and then there, there will be things that simplify. Okay. So then this implies that the minimal action that one can write on, on this lattice is something where uh, you have a coefficient that's typically called 1 minus g squared, and there will be the sum over all plaquettes of the trace of u dagger. Okay. So if you read the particle physics book in lattice QCD, chapter 1 is this. Okay. We have now derived roughly, yes. This is a theory without fermions, without matter at all. It's just pure gauge. If you want, it's pure gluons, or in the case of QD, it would be pure photons. Okay? It's already a complicated theory, okay? by the way, but there's no, no fermions. Actually, how to put fermions in these theories, it's very complicated. Okay? We will not discuss this in the sense that uh, we will utilize very rough formulations. I will show you tomorrow. But there's actually 
that important topic. People have discussed this for 20 years. And if you want to have a, what I find a very good reference on this, there is a book by Montvai and Munster, which is called um, Quantum Fields Analytics. which it's an old book, okay? It's from the early 90s, but I find it amazing because it has all the formulas and uh, really explains to you in detail how you pass from a continuous formulation to a lattice formulation, what is the proper path integral compression, blah, 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 okay? <sighs> Very good question. Very good question, of course. Then the question, uh, as Ali, Ali uh, let me repeat the question. Ali asked, okay, now we have a theory. So on the lattice, how do we actually know that this reproduces the same physics that is contained here, which is a theory which is defined not on the lattice, but on the continuum, okay? We have to take what is so-called continuum limit, okay? So we have to take this theory on the lattice. Inside here, there will be the lattice spacing as a parameter, and we will have to take the continuum limit. Continuum limit. Now, for traditional lattice field theory, the continuum limit is defined by taking the lattice spacing to zero while keeping the volume constant. Okay? This is what every lattice QCD computation does. In quantum simulations, we will see that this is actually not the way we take the continuum limit. Okay? The way we take the continuum limit is more similar to what we have in statistical mechanics. Okay? Statistic Imagine that you have a model which has two phases, like the easy model, and then a critical point in the middle. The critical point is the continuum limit of a field theory. Okay? Because there, the correlation length becomes much larger than your lattice spacing. Okay? Now, maybe some of this that I'm saying now is obscure. <coughs> but for us, the continuum limit will be approaching a, trans a phase transition. A critical point. Critical point. Because continuum limit means that the correlation length is much larger than the lattice spacing. Okay? Whether you get into the correct critical point is another question. Okay? But every, t every time we are, we are approaching a critical point, we can say that we are approximating a field theory on the lattice. But the lattice effects can be excluded up to a degree that, that needs to be quantified, but can be excluded. Is my answer clear? So uh, you can do it on whatever. Yes, yes, you're right. So this, uh, in fact, is the same action. So the structure of this action is true for every Lie group. Okay? So for Z2, for U1, for SUN, for SO3, blah, 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 this will always be the same structure if you do it at a Lagrangian level. Yeah, you can take, you can, you typically, yeah, I mean, for SUN, you have to take matrices, of course. If you want to do it for U1, what are these objects? These are U elements of U1. So instead of having matrices, then you have phases. And then you write a corresponding action with the phases. If you want to do for a U1. If you want to do a Z2 gauge theory, then you have to write uh, this essentially classical spins. Okay? Okay? Z3 gauge theory, there will be three level systems. Okay? And so on and so forth. So this prescription works for essentially all the groups. Yes? Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. It does. It does depend on the lattice that you choose. Okay. In high energy, this has not been really studied very much because <coughs> people only use the square lattice. There are, however, people by the group of... Um, Uh, 
listening. Okay, it didn't come up. It's the group in Pisa uh, that studied, um, if you put SU3 on what is called FCC lattice, so, so face center cube lattice, and they show that it behaves very similarly to the square lattice. We will see instead in condensed matter application, there there are huge differences. If you take the same theory, and you put it on a square and on a triangular lattice, the continuum limit is different. Uh, and maybe I will show it in the last lecture if I have time, because it's an important point that sometimes is not discussed. But the lattice is important, can be important. Okay, so another question. Mm -hmm. um, so those omegas, like those matrices out there, like yeah. we assume that they are unitary, right? Yeah, they are unitary, yes. Okay, and then is there like any relation that says that, for instance, you know what, if I have this omega x dagger and then like u x y, then like omega x and then omega x, then that thing would be the same as like just no gauge transformation or? Yes, because the, 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 I mean the product is one, is the identity, right? Yes. Um, so omega x dagger, omega x, it's an identity. Yeah, but then like if I wiggle this extra u in between yes. and then like omega is the same. Uh, okay, no, this I'm not. No, I'm not so sure I understood. Then, no, can you repeat the question? Yeah. So, if uh -huh. I had like this omega x, standard, yeah, then like normally I have like omega x, and then like there's omega y on the on the right, right? Like when I sum. No, 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 no. Uh, I, I messed up my notation. When you apply gauge transformation on a, on a vertex, you have only omega x. Oh, I see. No, I messed up my notation. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Because the gauge transformation is something that involves this vertex, and oh. it. In it is acting on the four links which touch the vertex. Oh, okay. Okay? So I think, yeah, I yeah, don't know. No. I messed up when I wrote something. It was actually, I wanted to write something different. Okay. So sorry. Next okay. time I will not write this. <laughs> More questions? Okay, let me go ahead. Oops, sorry. So continuum limit, minimal action. Uh, and then, what do you do with this minimal action? Okay. What people have done since, uh, I mean, first of all, let me maybe spend a couple of comments. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Uh, but do you work in a specific uh, representation of the SU3 group? Like the fundamental one, I don't know. Or Yes, so when you put matter, you have to fix a representation, for instance. Yeah, uh, but this level, yeah, you also have to fix it. But so are not. But there will be an integration of representations, actually, technically speaking. I, I'm, I'm flashing this over. Uh, in quantum simulation, this representation problem is a problem, in the sense that uh, in what is called a Hamiltonian formulation, it is very hard to allow more than one representation. It's not so clear what the effect is. Okay? Like people, I mean, people have studied that because, in principle, you have all the representations available. I mean, you can fix the representation of the fermions. You, you put the matter in a given representation, but then the gauge field can actually change. Uh, so it's a tricky problem. I mean, let me maybe come back to this question on the third day because we might encounter that. But, uh, okay. So what people do with this? is they put it on the lattice, and then they studied with the Monte Carlo simulation, so lattice QCD. I do Monte Carlo, Markov chain Monte Carlo. And this is really, I mean, the, the I think the original idea is come from Wilson, and then there will be many people, there will be many people since the, 70, so it's a field that has almost 50 years. It's a very well-developed field. And the idea is very simple of this Markov chain Monte Carlo, is that you have a partition function and you want to estimate the expectation value of an observable, okay, which is written like this. Sorry, uh, no, no, this is expectation value of an observable, is this one divided by the partition function. The partition function is just integration to the minus s, okay? And the idea is when you compute this, you write it as follows. This is a sampling. Uh, now I write it explicitly. Oh, 
e to the minus s divided by the integral e to the minus s. This object here, you want to see it as a probability distribution. So that's the goal of uh, Monte Carlo simulations. And this is always possible if your action is positive definite. So every time you have a positive action, you can, in principle, write down a Monte Carlo algorithm that computes this by some sort of integration. It doesn't imply that this is efficient. It can be very complicated. It may be exponentially inefficient, maybe non-ergodic, blah, blah, blah. But in principle, you can always do it. Okay? And of course, people in energy have, have made huge progresses along these directions. I mean, I think this lattice QCD is, is, is a field which has, has, has led to many developments. And I tell you just what I find as the most, most most amazing achievements. I mean, the first one is that they've been able to compute the low energy spectrum of the standard model of QCD. Ab initio, okay? So you just put in the masses of the quarks, few universal couplings, speed of light, they can compute the masses of the 10 lightest hadrons uh, and uh, other mesons and so on and so forth. Okay? This has been done in the early 2000s. Another amazing achievement, I mean, of course, QCD matrix elements, which is something which is very important if you want to understand the high energy experiments, of course, because it puts bounds on new physics, for instance. <coughs> Another thing that, I mean, a matrix element between different states. Imagine that, that you have different kind of... of uh, kind of, yeah. These are more Kabibo angles. I mean, it's... Uh, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? These are not necessarily cross-sections. In some cases, they reduce to cross-sections. Okay? But only asymptotically. I mean, one thing that maybe some of you have heard of, uh, there was a news article in the early 2000, 2021, that the, the standard model finally failed. Do you remember this? This uh, experiment on the magnetic dipole moment of the muon? No? Yes. Uh, this is one of the biggest things in science in 2021. I mean, these people did these experiments, and they found out that the, the dipole, magnetic dipole moment of the muon was outside all possible theoretical prediction by seven sigma. Okay? So it was really a discovery. And look, guys, the dipole moment of the moon, if it's wrong, the standard model does not work. Okay? But then, the day after, you check, if you were checking nature, there was a paper where people did lattice QCD computation to an unprecedented level of accuracy. And they showed that all theory papers before, they were wrong. Okay? But lattice QCD could do a, compu on a control computation with a slightly larger error bar, blah, blah, blah. But this new control computation was within the error bar of the experiment. So in one day, for one day, the standard model was almost dead. Okay? But indeed, it was not. I think this has been also one of the greatest ach achievements. Okay? Personally, one of the one that I really like a lot, magnetic dipole moment. And I think. One of the other things which is very interesting is that QCD really gave us hopes of studying the structure of the phase diagram of, of the QCD. Uh, so, sorry, lattice QCD gives us hope to study the phase diagram of QCD. Of QCD. And the phase diagram, diagram no, sorry, the phase diagram of QCD is not interesting just. Because we are theorists, we have a Lagrangian, let's study the phase diagram. I mean, it's interesting because there, are, there is, of course, direct experimental consequences. Now, let me just sketch it very briefly. So the two main parameters of the phase diagram of QCD are 
temperature, and here what is called chemical potential of the baryon. We call it mu, chemical potential baryons. In this phase diagram, our world lives here. Okay? And the structure of the phase diagram is as follows. Okay? But this, and now I will tell you what we really know and what is more conjectured. Okay? So here there might be superconducting phases. But it's not known. Here there is what is called quark gluon plasma. This phase is confined. And here there might be other phases. People don't know, really. This, the transition between confined and, and, and quark gluon plasma here is actually a crossover. And it is believed that then it becomes a second order phase transition, or at least there is a critical point at, at the beginning of that. Okay. So this is super cool because, I mean, where are these different instances coming up? I mean, this uh, this phase here, this phase here is actually relevant for high density neutron stars. Okay, high density is something where the chemical potential is large, so there are many particles on neutron stars. So if you want to study astrophysics, maybe you want to have the equation of state of neutron stars. So to, to, to do that, you, have, you will have to have the equation of states of QCD. Then what is happening here and here instead is something that is available in experiments. I mean, so this is LHC, so very low density but very high temperature. This is RIC. Experiments at Brookhaven where they collide heavy ions. I will talk about this longer. So here there is a very rich phenomenology, potentially. The problem is that the only region where we can do control simulations is actually the region very close to this line. So here one can do controlled Monte Carlo simulations. Later on, I will tell you why. Okay. There is also another regime, which is, of course, very interesting. When you increase the chemical potential, at some point there is also Inside here, there is also nuclear physics. Eh? Nuclear physics. Hmm? But anyway, I mean, while many of this is unknown, and later on I will tell you why, there have been things that have been understood here. I mean, this, the nature of the... I mean, I think the first prediction of quad gluon plasma, which was controlled, was really an achievement of lattice QCD. So the, the fact that the determination of the critical temperature Lattice QCD. The fact that this was a transition, the transition was a crossover lattice QCD. I mean, many of these achievements have really been possible only through this amazing development in doing Markov chain Monte Carlo simulations of the lattice. Hmm? However, yes. For the moon, I think uh, you can compute it probably directly through a response function. Yeah. It's a dipole moment, right? So dipole moment for me is always a matrix element uh, between two different states. Probably it requires also, I mean, this is not a property that very likely you can ex uh, get only from QCD. You need also QED. So you need a simulation which also takes into consideration QED. And th people have done it. Huh? I don't know the details. I mean, these are definitely not things that I can do, okay? <laughs> these are the top in the world of computational particle physics that do these things, okay? I'm not part of this. Hmm? Now, <clears throat> so I, I have partially spoiled my motivation, but uh, now let me rephrase it, because I got drawn by an excitement. So since this has been so successful, why do we do why do we want to do quantum simulation or quantum computing of QCD? 
it looks like you can just do classical simulation. You, you have learned many things. You can go on. Well, there are two problems okay, that now we'll discuss. Okay? Two problems, what I mean is scenarios where a quantum simulation approach might provide in interesting insights. Okay? And the first scenario is really equilibrium physics. What is it called? Fine. Oh, there is a question. We cannot hear the question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I will repeat the questions when you ask, guys, or please wait for the microphone, including the organizer. Okay. You have a question? Then wait for the microphone. <laughs> Uh, if you increase the potential of the baryons, it looks like a depression or doping in a real system of the material contest. Yes, yes, you're right. In fact, if you see this phase diagram, <laughs> think about the phase diagram of the Hubbard model or the cuprates. It's a dome. This phase is ordered, so it's confining. There, there is something which is deconfining, can be weird, this core gluon plasma here. Okay, in, in cuprates, this might be something slightly different because of pseudo, do, uh, pseudo gap. Okay, but this would be the next state. Here, there is a superconducting phase. So the structure of it is very similar. In fact, if you read all the reviews about the Hubbard model, so there is a famous review paper, which I like a lot, Review of Modern Physics, 2006 by Lee Nagaosa. And when? It's called Mob Dopina Mott Insulator, blah, blah, blah. This is essentially a review of, of gauge theories. <laughs> so you can utilize gauge theories very, in a very elegant manner to describe many of the phenomenology that is happening here. This will be a confined phase, this will be a deconfined phase, this will be a superconducting instability in the gauge theory. So there are strong similarities. Maybe it's also better to be careful. I mean, this strong similarity do not, doesn't mean that, that all the concepts transfer from one to the other. Eh? But uh, the, you made a, I think your observation is correct, and this has been also discussed uh, very in intensively. Good. So why do we want to do quantum simulation of UCD? So reason number one, which I've already partially spoiled, finite density. Finite density, there is a lot of interest in physics, superconductivity, phase transitions, core gluon plasmas, blah, 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 blah. But I told you we cannot do the simulations. Okay. Why? Why are simulations hard? Classical simulations. And the reason is what is so called sign problem. Okay. How many of you have heard about the sign problem? Good, a few. So I, now I tell you what it is. Sign problem. And the idea is the following. Is that we have seen before, we need to have a probability distribution. Ah, okay, easier. We need to have a probability distribution, which is fine, and we can always do it if this is positive, if the action is positive definite. So what happens in QCD is that uh, the action if we put the finite chemical potential, becomes equal, okay, the Lagrangian. The Lagrangian becomes equal to the Lagrangian itself minus I mu chemical potential, sum over all the possible flavors, number of flavors. Okay. So if you put a chemical potential, the, the Lagrangian becomes complex. <gasps> this implies that if we look at the action, the action becomes will become the original one, real part, initially is only real, but there will be also an imaginary part of the action. If we reaction as an imaginary part, no way we can do Monte Carlo simulation, because this probability distribution can also become negative. 
a negative probability distribution implies that we cannot, no, we do not know how to sample. Okay? No probability distribution. Now, <coughs> in principle, there are ways around it. What you could do, you could do a trick of this type. Hmm? Now, I really, let me write down the phone. You, you can take your operator and say, okay, my operator, its expectation value is my integral over all my variables, o e to the minus s, and here I have the integral e to the minus s. What I do, I write it as a ratio. Okay? I write, first, let me write it explicitly, this s. I have my integral, blah, 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 blah. And here I do the following. I take o e to the minus i s i, and this I take here. And here I take only the real part. And then I divide it by the same thing that I had in the only real case, e to the minus s, s real. And then I take this guy, I rewrite it here. This would be the integral e to the minus i s i, e to the minus s real. And here I put the same stuff, integral. Oh, e to the minus s r. Okay? I'm just uh, rewriting things. And then I say, okay, let me do the following trick. Instead of sampling with uh, something which I know is not positive definite, I sampling, I simply uh, sample with this prefactor here. So I look at this. So uh, somehow I take the original probability distribution that I had before, and here I have instead of one integral, I have the ratio of two integrals. Okay? So this guy will be the expectation value of O e to the minus i s i computed with the action s r. And this will be 1 divided by the expectation value of this, of e to the minus i s i, with respect to the action s r. Wow. s r is positive definite. I can do my sampling. Same problem does not exist anymore. This would be naive. I mean, it's not naive. You can do this. Okay? But then you realize that there is the following problem. Is that here, what you are trying to sample, in this integral is very, is very easy to see. Okay? Here you are trying to sample a function that whose, whose sign oscillates very fast. In the extreme limit, you are trying to take an average of a sign plus and a sign minus. So this is something that on average is zero. Okay? Sampling something which is on average zero over a large volume is something that requires a number of samples that grows exponentially with the volume. Uh. I mean, with this integral, it's very simple to see. With this other, it's a bit less simple because it depends on O. Okay? So in principle, you can solve the same problem at the price of getting an exponential cost in your sampling. This is a problem which is called signal-to-noise ratio. Okay? You cannot just beat that. Okay? You cannot sample for long. Signal-to-noise. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, if you don't believe these arguments, I now have prepared a small mathematical challenge for you. Okay? Try to compute. I, I give you the following integral. Okay? Take the integral over dx over minus infinity plus infinity on the complex plane, dx, of e to the minus z minus i kappa square 
and z of course is equal to x plus i y. Okay, but they integrate it only over the x direction. Now this integral, I mean, analytically, this is a Gaussian shift. So this integral is square root of pi. Okay. However, if you try to plot this function on the real plane, this function is like this. Because there will be, a, I mean, if you expand it, you see this is cosine on the real part that is going on like crazy. And I challenge each of you to do this computation. You can go and try to do it on Mathematica, okay, with a Monte Carlo. And do this, for this computation for values of k, for values of k, which are equal to 0 0.1, 1.0, 10, and 100. And then you tell me this afternoon what the result was. My prediction, <coughs> based on what I told you earlier, is that there will be some, some of these where this simulation is easy, and some of these for which you will get nonsense. Oh, there is a Ah, you don't. S the sign problem is related to the read the Newton's patent constraint through the absolute. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm sorry, uh, Jalil. I, uh, I do not know. It's possible that is related, but uh, I don't know. It, but I can tell you in the context of condensed matter, it's definitely a problem that also appears in the study. When you try to do Monte Carlo simulation of a Hubbard model, it's the same problem as here. Okay. Away from a half feeling. Sorry. Other questions? Yes. I'm only integrating over x, but of course, it's a, a, confl a complex barrier. Yeah, it's only over x. <coughs> okay. So uh, you said the Hubbard model has this problem. So away it from has my feeling, this problem all the times, or where? It okay. You so, put it in some okay. particular conditions. Excellent question. Okay, the same problem is uh, something which is uh, as many faces. First is a problem that depends on the basis. So you, if you if you write a path integral, you have to at some point decide, decide the base. Some bases will give the same problem. Some others might not. Okay. Sometimes the same problem can be solved. Okay, there are either you choose a, a smarter basis or there is a transformation like here. I mean, here we, we know that this integral is simple. So it makes, I mean, and we will get this integral by just solving a Gaussian. Okay? The solution to this problem, if you want to sample it, to do a translation in complex plane, you don't get any pole, so the integral on over the complex plane is the same. You are essentially moving moving your integration domain. Okay? So there are ways of solving the same problem. But in general, it's not solvable. And actually, there, is, there has been a paper, which is very important, by uh, Troyer and Wiese. It's a PRL in 2005. Uh, essentially, the, the claim of this paper is there are instances of the same problem which are npr Same problem. Let me write like this. Is npr In fact, certain instances, but okay, that's the same. That's the concept. npr it implies that there is no way you can solve it in, in polynomial time under general conditions, which is something that I've, I've formulated here as a signal to noise problem. Okay? You need an exponentially long time to solve this. Yes? No, no, wait, microphone, microphone. So 
So the only way to solve it is just be like to try all the bases because uh, is, th is there an invariant way to look at the Hamiltonian and see that is there is a sign problem here or there is not? There is some proof of that? No, not that I know of. <coughs> There are certain approaches to the same problem that are based on finding a proper basis change such that you can clean off the phases. The mathematics is very interesting. It's the mathematics of Lifshitz thimbles. Has any of you ever heard about Lifshitz thimbles? Ah, few do. Okay, these are structures in, in the context of, of topology of, of metric spaces where you're essentially trying to identify a surface of constant. Uh, phase, and then there, you reparameterize your integral, and everything is positive, definite, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> but this is very hard. Okay? It's something people are working on. You can also give you references if you're interested, but it's a hard thing. Okay. Let me go at so this. We have seen the same problem. I've also given you a mathematics exercise, which I'm not so sure you wanted, but uh, <laughs> right. uh, I just want to mention that this was reason one, but there is also reason two. And the reason number two, I can do it here. is out of equilibrium dynamics. And the reason why out of equilibrium dynamics is, is relevant in, in particle physics is because many experiments are very out of equilibrium. Okay? In particular, if you think about this, uh, already my very naive condensed matter mindset for energy is that, okay, I take bunch of particles, then I crash them to death, okay? Very strong, one against each other. And this is, in fact, what is happening at these colliders. This is the thing which is farthest from equilibrium you can think of. Okay? There is a huge amount of energy there that then is relaxed, and then you study the products of these collisions, okay? So this implies that if you would like to, s to simulate ab initio what is happening in this collider, you will have to solve the time-dependent Schrodinger equation corresponding, well, not Schrodinger equation, but the Dirac equation that, that, that is corresponding to that, okay? So this is colliders. And in particular, in the context of QCD, one thing which is very important is the collision between heavy ions. Okay? Ion, ion collisions. These are really this RIC and LHC experiments. And you, I mean, one of the reasons why we would like to do that with quantum computers is because the only way one can study this collision is through effective dynamics, which can be predictive in some regimes, but on other regimes it's very hard to really understand how to do these computations controlled in a controlled manner. Okay? Particular question like thermalization of these heavy ion collisions, uh, what is called freeze out. So that is understanding where one one can interpret the results of this collision as an equilibrium. Um, Result. There are, these are all questions which are open, and one will really require a method to solve the time-dependent time problem. And the reason why the time-dependent problem cannot be solved here is that first we cannot even we cannot even write the path integral as I've done before, because what I've done before was an equilibrium problem. In principle, what you can do you can write down a Keldish action. Uh, then, if you do that, you, it's not that you have the same problem. Actually, there, it becomes complex. The object that here is just maybe a sign. There, it becomes a complex thing. So you can forget about sampling it. It's called complex action problem. It's even more severe than the sign problem. At least conceptually. Okay. So that is, uh, I would say, application two. Re reason two for which we want to study quantum computing 
Uh, so we want to <coughs> we want to study how quantum computing and quantum simulation can can be applied to QCD. Now, of course, this is a very very I want to, I would like to state it now. These are the motivation. It's a very long road. QCD is a very complicated theory with a lot of elements, and quantum simulators are not expected to have all the elements at the very beginning. Okay, one should think about this as a roadmap. Okay, first maybe studying low dimensional theories with simpler gauge groups, without taking the continuum limit and so on and so forth. And then on a very, on, only on a very long run, one can aim maybe in 20 years or so to really say something quantitative about QCD. Okay? I don't want to give the impression, okay, now we have the motivation, we do it. Okay? Please. Oh. Um, it's a, a, a question uh, about the reason two, because reason one, it's okay for me because uh, you have this region in the phase diagram that you cannot perform calculations mm -hmm. with the classical computer. But it's not clear to me why reason two is a, a reason. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't understand why this is a reason about the okay. advantage of quantum simulations of... Okay. Uh, where where classical computations f fails when you want to study reason two? Okay. Suppose that you want to study this heavy ion collisions ab initio. Okay? That's a very high time dependent problem, right? For instance, one thing that you can study is you, call, you call, uh, crash these ions, how many baryons are produced? Okay? This is not a question about the phase diagram now. Okay. It's still a question about time dependent process. And maybe you want to understand it because you would like to see how baryons interact with each other under very high uh, out of equilibrium conditions. Okay? And this is what is happening in the experiment, right? This you cannot compute with the path integral very easily. Okay? And it's experimentally relevant because people then go and measure this. Yeah. Okay? So uh, that it, it was just a, a, a question about the, 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 how, what we can calculate with the, the path integral. So, yeah. Okay. This we cannot do. We cannot do no. it. Okay, People, okay, let me say, it's not that we know nothing about it, okay? There, there is a very, very strong heavy ion collision theory community, which has developed approximate method to compute the dynamics, and has also had success in terms of reproducing results. But they can only address typically, well, mostly address regimes where there is hydrodynamics popping out. So typically, relatively long times. At short times, where there are phenomena like hadronization, so you crunch these ions and then new hadrons pop up. This is not, I mean, the hydrodynamics is not able to predict. Okay? This you will really need to solve the QCD equations ab initio to understand. Thank you. Most Cheers. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether my question has some sense in this, in this context, but uh -huh. is there some Hamiltonian formalism for this Lagrangian? Yes, we will do it. Yes, because I, there is. I expect that in the Hamiltonian formalism, you have a non-emission Hamiltonian. And in principle, it is an open quantum system. Ah, no, no. Okay, no, no, no. Uh, if you have a Hamiltonian formalism, the Hamiltonian remains emission. So, but this transformation looks different there. It looks different. What you will get, you will have an Hamiltonian that when you exchange, for instance, two, two fermions, it gets a complex phase. Okay? But the Hamiltonian operator re remains uh, Hermitian. Okay? So it's, uh, it's, it's a bit different uh, the way you formulate the same problem there. No, no, okay, you can do, okay, in the Hamiltonian, what you can take is the, the conventional definition of, uh, of this is, is always fine. But the problem is that how do you do this integration when you have fermions? You have to put, of course, a Slater determinant or something. And this determinant can get negative. So you, you will have a function that you try to sample that sometimes is positive, sometimes is negative. Okay? The functional the functional here. Yeah, I mean it's maybe I do it tomorrow. No, I mean maybe I do it tomorrow. Because what we will do is we will use the Hamiltonian formalism because I mean of course in a quantum simulator you don't put a Lagrangian, you put a Hamiltonian. So this is important to, to use the Hamiltonian formulation. The same problem has a slightly different origin, so you have to formulate it differently. Cheers. We have lost the organizer with the microphone. Ah, okay. 
Any other question? We stop here. Maybe now... Yes, guys, I see you. You want a break. Okay, no, I, I will stop here if, if that's okay with you, Ali. Uh, any questions? I mean, if you have further questions, you can yes. Okay. Yeah, no, questions, of course, we take. So I've seen uh, ways that uh, in which people get around the sign problem in Keldish non-equilibrium theory, in which they deform the contour of integration with like least gradient method, uh, I think. Yes. Is that related to what you mentioned um, some minutes ago when we were discussing this integral? Yeah, you can also use leaf sheet symbols to, to uh, address the complex action problem. Yeah. I don't know if the works that you have seen are doing this, but that, that's feasible. Another way is to sample, for instance, the perturbation theory expansion. This also people have done, condensed matter, uh, in trans even in transport. Uh, that's, that's another setting. More questions? No? Okay, so... If there are no further questions, let's thank the, our lecturer. Thank you. Yeah. See you later. Three hours of speaking. Yeah. Okay.